please stand as we hear the gospel for this, for this Sunday. It's taken from John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, Verily, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. Please be seated. In my uh, personal devotions, and just by way of reminder, you know, from, when you phone here from 9 to 9.30, and I'm usually here at that time, I generally will not answer the phone. I'm having it as my quiet time, my prayer time. And I am right now reading the book of Isaiah. And the chapter that I'm on is Isaiah chapter 62. And these words just jumped out at me, especially as I was preparing for this Sunday. Upon your walls, O Jerusalem, I have posted sentinels. And all day and all night they will never be silent. And so today's message for us, you know, the offspring of the Reformation movement is simply this. Wake! Awake! The watchmen are crying. Join me silently as I pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, through Christ our Lord, that you continue to raise up not only messengers, men and women who are bold in proclaiming that Jesus is alive, but that you keep raising up churches who are willing to stand in the gap, who are willing through how we live and how we speak to make the people around us aware and awake that Jesus is alive and that he's coming again so that they may come to faith in him and in that last moment in life know the salvation that you, Jesus, have provided for them. Amen. I turned 50 in 2007. I was living in Ottawa. I was a pastor of All Saints Lutheran Church. And some person, younger than I, had this wonderful idea. Let's take the youth and bicycle across Canada. We'll start in Ottawa, we'll head due east and make our way to Vancouver. And on the way we will gather money for Canadian Lutheran World Relief. And of course if we want to do this, it's absolutely imperative that the pastor joins them. <laughs> I went, what? What are you talking about? And they said, yes, Pastor Greg, we feel it's necessary and important for you as our representative to bicycle with our youth across to Vancouver. And I said to them very politely, thank you, but no thank you. You know, I mean, I'm 50. Nevertheless, our two sons, Philip, our oldest, and Jesse, our youngest, who was 13 at the time, in support with Chris, you know, said, Dad, you can do it. You know, come along. And, and seriously, throughout the whole trip, I had joy, times of joy, and there were times where I just was, what have I gotten myself into? But what's amazing in this planning, what's amazing in the trip was this, that I went around, we had 13 youth, and I had asked them, have any of you seen grain elevators before? And there were a couple kids whose parents were raised in Melville, Saskatchewan and Outlook, Saskatchewan and the parents had said sure we know what a grain elevator is but they're kids so here we are we're bicycling across you know we leave the province of Manitoba twin highway coming into Musuman, Saskatchewan going toward Regina on the number one and behold it's prairie time 
But what's amazing is that in the distance, as you come to the rural towns in the prairies, not only did they see the vast countryside, but guess what they saw? These elevators, these grain elevators, and they could see them for miles and miles. And here we are bicycling against the wind, and they're wondering, how close is this town? You know, they didn't realize how big the elevators are. And on the flat prairie land, how far you could see. The elevator was the key distinguishing feature for many a town, many a hamlet, many a city in our country. How many grew up with elevators in their town? How many can remember from a distance seeing the elevator or elevators? How many can remember when the elevators burned in bigger Saskatchewan? Mid, mid national news, it just was like a glory to Jesus that the whole thing was in fire, right? 1981. Just recently married, Chris and I, wondering what to do, you know, in a way for our life, decided to plan a trip to Europe, Western Europe, to go to the country of England, to Norway to West Germany, then it was divided between the East and the West. And we were going to do it by bicycle. And we did it. We spent six months bicycling. Chris is going, oh yeah, I remember, bad decision. <laughs> no, you know, um, what I want to point out is that when we arrived in the city, we came from Oslo to Kiel and then down to Mannheim, uh, you know, we got our bicycles and then we, you know, bicycled back to Frankfurt and then around the area heading south to uh, the Black Forest area. We can remember that here we are bicycling along the secondary roads in Germany, the third, you know, countryside roads in Germany. And from a distance, we didn't see grain elevators. Nine. There was no such thing as a tall grain elevator. But we saw the steeple of a church. Yeah? You come into the city of Cologne, Cologne, and what's the biggest building you're going to see even today? The cathedral, right? It stands out in, in Europe, in Western Europe, and particularly in Germany. You go to the small cities, the small villages, the city has a church and it stands tall you know and it is the largest building in some of those cities like the city of Worms has a wall surrounding the city the old city they will call it and there people built walls around their cities and the church stood in the center and on the wall stood the sentinels the watchman whose job and responsibility it was for the people in the city upon seeing any enemy to cry out awake awake get up out of your sleep behold the enemy comes and if they chose to remain silent the people would fall prey to the foe who was ready to devour them. They would shout out, awake, awake, close the door. And the first thing that they would do is they would go to the top of the church's steeple and do what? Pull the bell. Reminding the people that the time to awake from your sleep has come. That's really what the Reformation period was all about. It was a time in human history when a big chunk of the world was falling asleep to not only political ills and social ills, but even more so within the existing Christian church at that time, people's faith life in Jesus was going asleep. It wasn't for lack of faith, 
It's just that after a while, when you kept doing the same as, same as, it really made people go like this. You know? They weren't zombies. They were sleepwalkers. You know, they were literally walking in their sleep with God. And so God raised up at this time in human history, in this part of the world, messengers who were bold and courageous in crying out, Awake! Awake! The Lord is coming! Awake! Awake! Make your faith alive in Jesus! Men like Martin Luther, men like Ulrich Zwingli in, in Switzerland, men like John Calvin, Men like Menno Simons, the Mennonites. Men like Johann Huss in you know, Czechoslovakia, the Moravians, are just some examples of messengers that God used to get people awakened from their sleep. Yes, the slow, soft, tender approach was tried, you know. Don't wake up the sleeping guy because, you know, it might scare them. So at times, you know, we tried to gently nudge. But every once in a while, that doesn't work. And God had to do a real... Uh. <laughs> John, stand up. God had to do a real, you know, grab him like this. <laughs> wake up, you know. Thanks, John. Because what is at stake isn't being a nice person. What is at stake is one's eternal life and one's life in Christ now. And our Father in Heaven is really concerned about life today, 60 years of marriage, but life eternally, forever and ever in the marriage feast that has no ends. Wake up, people. That's what it means to celebrate a Reformation heritage. That's what it means to be a church of the Reformation. It doesn't mean just being, quote, Lutheran and celebrating it like we are children of Abraham. Even God can raise up from stones, you know. To be a offspring of the Reformation means that we are willing in how we believe and what we say to remind one another, at times air so gently, but at times very loudly and graphically, when we sense that a sleepiness has come into our midst, when we sense that your brother and sister in Christ, who may be sitting right next to you, is drowsing off in the Lord, to boldly say, to be that watchman that boldly cries out, Awake! Awake, for night is coming. The time to be awoken is today so that you may fight the good fight. You may run the race and in the end receive the victorious crown that Christ has won for you. Amen? Amen.